that's a lot farther to drag this thing from all the way over there. But I love the room. I can like walk really far now. We'll, we'll see how far I get. Um, but as we're getting started, I have a story to tell. You see, when I was younger, our, our pastor, he explained that he had this policy that if he was going to use his children as a sermon illustration, he, they had an agreement that he would pay them $5 for every time that he used them in a sermon illustration. Fortunately for me, I never made that deal. So I can use my kids as much as I want. And yesterday, yesterday, some of my kids, Abby, not calling by name, but yesterday my kids wanted to go for a walk. They wanted to, to go down to the gas station. Now, it was, it was about zero degrees yesterday. It was cold. And she has a history of not taking a coat and thinking that it's just fine to, to go without a coat. And so I said, you can go, but you need to take a coat. And she did. She took the coat out the front door and stuck it in the back of my truck and then kept on walking. And it reminds me. It reminds me that kids today, there may be a whole lot of technology, there, there may be a whole lot of things, society may be different, but kids today are the same as they always were because I remember when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I don't remember what I did, but my mom had some really creative punishments, and the punishment that I received was that I had to go to school for an entire week wearing a collared shirt. It was like, oh, the worst thing in the world to me. I wanted to wear a t-shirt. I wanted to wear a sweatshirt, anything but a collared shirt. It's kind of funny looking back on it today. But it was the worst thing imaginable. But not long into the week, I discovered something. I think it came about because I was playing basketball with some of my friends and have you ever tried to play basketball in a collared shirt? It, it doesn't work very well. And so in the midst of playing basketball, I ended up taking off the shirt because I realized I, I still had a white shirt underneath. I could just wear the white shirt. And then it dawned on me, I could do that the whole day. And it worked really well until my mom came to pick me up from school and I was just wearing a white t-shirt. Needless to say, my, my week of wearing a collared shirt was extended, but that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was the talk that we had afterward, where she sat me down and, and she explained that I had broken her trust, that, that she had trusted me to, to, to follow through with this, but, but now she couldn't trust me anymore. That the trust was a fragile thing that it's really easy to break, but it takes a long time to rebuild it. And the, the worst part, the worst part was not the extension of the punishment. The worst part was sitting there listening to my mom as she told me, I'm, I'm just disappointed. I'm disappointed in how you've behaved. I'm disappointed in, I thought I taught you better than that. And as we've been looking at, at Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, what we call 1 Corinthians, Paul has had a whole lot of things to get on them about. As we said, this is a letter of correction. They've done a whole lot of things wrong, and, and Paul is trying to, to right the ship. And as we've looked over this letter, we, we kind of summarized it last week. The, the theme that's running through this letter, it says, we have freedom, but we need unity. We have freedom to do all these things, but we need to come together as the body of Christ. And as we look over all the things that we've discussed, from, from marriage to, to lawsuits and, and all these things, we can see this theme working through each and every one, and it's going to continue to be the theme as we go through this letter. And as we pick up where we left off last week, we come to, to chapter 11, verse 12. And in chapter 11, verse 12, Paul tells us, Now, I don't praise you as I give the following instruction. Because when you meet together, it does more harm than good. 
This verse right here, it, it reminds me of that conversation with my mom. Where it, it wasn't so much the punishment, but the disappointment. And here Paul is telling them, I'm, I'm disappointed in you guys. I mean, contrast that back with the beginning of chapter 11, where he told him, I praise you because you remember the traditions that I taught you. You remember all the instructions. There he, he's trying to, to find something to praise them about. He's trying to find the silver lining. But here he's like, guys, I'm trying. I'm trying to find something to praise you about. But frankly, I can't. I'm disappointed because you're coming together and it's supposed to be building one another up, but, but you're more divided. You're causing more harm than good when you come together. And he goes on to explain the matter in detail, saying, first of all, when you meet together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. It's necessary that there are groups among you to make to make it clear who is genuine. As we've looked at this, the, the, the theme has been you have freedom, but we need unity. And, and this portion right here, it kind of, it focuses on that last part. The, we need unity. And that's exactly what this church didn't have. They were divided. They were separating themselves out. And... To be clear, as Paul says, there are going to be groups. Not everybody is going to get along with everybody else. And we're going to have some groups where, well, these people, they're, they're in the same, the same season of life or, or we have similar interests. And, and you're going to have people that, that you just prefer to hang out with more than others. And, and that's okay. That's to be expected. But that's not what was happening here. These divisions that Paul is talking about, that they were rival groups. They were people working against each other. The, the word divisions here that he uses in these verses, it's the same word that he used back at the beginning of the letter. In chapter 1, where he said, Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other. And don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. These rival groups, these groups that were, they didn't just exist in the same area, but they were, they were against each other. They were, they were trying to be better than the next. They were, they were trying to, they were cliques, if you will, factions where this is my group over here, and you have your group over there. I've drawn my circle, and these are the people that I will accept. And the response of the other group was, well, fine, if you're going to have your group, then I'm going to have my group, and we're going to be a better group. And they bickered, and they fought, and they, they separated themselves out. That's not how the church is supposed to be. Theologian William Barclay in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, he kind of lays out what was going on and how the church should respond. There's a poem. I don't know if he wrote it or if he put someone else's poem in there, but, but the poem that he wrote says, He drew a circle that shut me out. Rebel, heretic, thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. And you see, this it gets down to the heart of what was going on. Because there were people who were drawing their circle and they were saying, you're not one of us. You are excluded. You're not the in group. And the other group responded by drawing their own circle. But the way of Christ, the way the church is supposed to respond... Just like the poem says, when they draw their circle, when they, when they cut us out, our response should be to draw an even bigger circle, to include them and others so that we can be united in love. Because to draw those little circles, that's a choice. Maybe it starts off 
you know, without, without thinking about it. It just kind of happens. But to remain in that circle, that is a choice. To say we are accepted and you are excluded, that is a choice that we have to make. And as Paul continues going on, th there was more to it than this. He says, when you get together in one place, it isn't to eat the Lord's meal. Each of you goes ahead and eats a private meal. One person goes hungry while another gets drunk. Now, this, this is kind of a foreign concept to us. And beca that's because in, in today's day, when, when, we, when we have the Lord's meal, when we have the Lord's Supper or, or the Eucharist or, or communion, we've kind of sanitized it in our modern church where we've kind of broken it down to its elements and, and its tradition and its rituals. And so when, when we have communion, everybody gets their, their piece of bread and everybody gets their, their cup of juice and nobody is expecting to get full on this. Nobody's expecting to be like, oh man, I can't go to lunch today because we had communion and I am stuffed. Nobody's expecting that. Except for maybe Grayson, because he wanted the recipe for the communion bread. But, but nobody is expecting that you're going to get full off of communion. And so this idea of getting full and going hungry with the Lord's Supper, it, it's foreign to us. Because we don't do it in the same way. Because back in those days, in, in that early church, if you remember, when Jesus did all of this and instituted the sacrament, he did it in a meal as he gathered together with his disciples. And this was a tradition that was carried on in what they referred to often as a love feast. Now, this may be something you guys maybe have never heard of this before, but what the church did was everybody in the church would bring a little something, maybe a a casserole or a hot dish, and, and everybody would, would put it all together, and then they would share in a meal, and everybody would take a little bit of everything, kind of like what we would call a potluck today. But the idea, I mean, I've talked about it, when we have potlucks, the idea is not that you sit with your family and, and you just converse with your little friends, but, but that we build one another up, that we get outside of our circles, that we have unity in the church that we build that community that's the whole idea of potlucks and that was the idea of these love feasts that we would build one another up and they would add to that all of the everything that goes into the lord's supper or communion but that's not what was happening in the church as paul describes it it seems that there were the haves and the have-nots. And he doesn't go into a whole bunch of detail, but, I mean, we know human nature. We know how people act. And so I don't know this is exactly what was going on, but I can imagine there were some people in the church, they would come to these love feasts, and they would, they would go all out. They would bring the prime rib. They would bring, you know, the very best. And they were excited to share until they saw the person over there who brought a bag of Doritos and just called it good and said, I made my contribution. Or, or some people didn't even bring anything. And so then all of it gets pulled together. And the person who brought the prime rib, they, I mean, they brought this much. And they only ate this much. And eventually they, they're like, this isn't fair. Why am I bringing this much? And they're bringing a bag of chips. But we all get the same thing. If I'm bringing a whole bunch, I expect to get well fed. And so... They took what was theirs and they said, we're going to have our thing and we're going to have our little potluck and all the people who bring the stuff, that's who's going to get to eat. And so all the haves would get together and they would have this great meal where they shared and where, where everybody left full and drunk. And then there was the other group, the other group that would go away hungry. And I'm sure they, they had their rationale, they had their excuses, why, why this was justified, why they should do it this way. But as Paul saw it, the ones who didn't bring much, 
I'm sure there were some freeloaders. There's always some freeloaders in the group. But the ones who didn't bring much, they didn't bring much because they didn't have much. Remember, the, the church in Corinth, it was, a, it was a melting pot. It was like a whole bunch of everybody. It was, it was Jews and Gentiles. It was slaves and free. You can imagine there was some disparity between the slaves and the free, the haves and the have-nots. And so one group would stick in their little clique, in their little group, and they would have a great time. And they would get their fill, all while excluding and causing the others to go hungry. Because they had these, these factions, these cliques. And if you don't know what a clique is, you can just watch any teen drama movie. And it will explain it because you see that you have, you have the jocks over here and you have the nerds over there and you have the popular kids there and you have the social outcasts over there and one group doesn't get to go to the others. I mean, some of them don't want to go to the others, but even if one of the nerds wanted to be friends with the jocks or, or one of the social outcasts with the popular kids, you didn't cross those lines because they wouldn't let you. There was a barrier that you could not get past even if you wanted to. And that's the issue that Paul's having with this church. Because they had erected these barriers. And that's exactly what Christ died to break down. To break down these barriers between this group and that. That you're in and you're out. He said, no, everybody is welcome through the blood of Christ. These barriers are broken down. There's no longer Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female. All are one in Christ. And so Paul concludes in verse 22 telling the church, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on God's churches and humiliate those who have nothing? What can I say to you? Will I praise you? No. No, I don't praise you in this. It's the same thing I heard from my mom. No. I'm disappointed. Because I thought I taught you better. I thought you knew better than this. Where have I failed that, that you didn't understand that you've gotten this wrong? And Paul kind of lays out the areas, the, the reasons why he's disappointed in that last verse. Because first of all, first of all, they missed the entire reason to have this love feast. They missed the reason that they were coming together. They missed, they missed the concept that when you come together, when you share this meal, when you celebrate this sacrament, it's to, it's to highlight our unity. It's not to divide us. Again, there's nothing wrong with having a meal with your friends. There's nothing wrong with, after church, I'm sure many of us are going to go to a restaurant or, or go out to lunch, or, or maybe you're going to invite somebody over to your house to, to eat. That's good. That's great. That's perfectly okay to have your, your friends and, and those that you like to hang out with. Paul said there are going to be groups. But even with the groups, there shouldn't be division. When it comes to this love feast... When it comes to this thing that, that's supposed to be uniting us together, this church, they, they completely missed it. They didn't bring everyone together. In fact, they divided them even more. And in so doing, they, they showed a lack of respect for God's church. For, for the, the foundation of, of, of what the church was supposed to be. Again, there's not a problem with meeting together with your friends, getting together and, and hanging out with, with people of, of like mind or, or in the same season of life. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the church. The church is not a place to just come hang out with your friends. The church is not a social club if you want to join a social club, there are plenty of them. Join 
the, the elks or, or the eagles or, or the lions or whatever other animal group you want to join. You can join those and their entire purpose is to get together and, and be social with the people that you like. But the church was never meant to be that way. The church was meant to break down those barriers, to welcome in everybody. The church was supposed to be a hospital, not a social club. And so as, as they're, they're shutting people out, they are going against the very heart of not only this love feast, but of what the church is supposed to be. And when you turn the church into a social club, what you are doing is you are taking the focus off of God. You are taking the glory away from God and you are redirecting it to yourself. And this is what I want. This is, this is what I want things to be and, and how I want things to be. And we shift the focus upon ourselves. And in so doing, they embarrassed and they humiliated their brothers and sisters. The church was supposed to be a place where people came together, where slave and free could, could be together as one, unified in Christ. The church was supposed to be different than all these other groups that separated people out. And so these, these other groups, they were told, come to the church, you can find freedom in Christ, you can, you can be free of all of this and we'll all be one together. And they got there. And they're like, no, you guys, you guys don't belong. You guys, you guys might be in the church, but you're not part of this group in the church. Imagine the embarrassment, the, the humiliation. I thought this was different, but I fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. They're not, they're not different. They're the same as everyone else. The church is supposed to be a place where where all come together to glorify God, where we are all united in Christ. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing as we celebrate the sacrament of communion. The sacrament of communion is, is a time to, to commit ourselves to Christ, to receive him in us and to, to recommit or to commit our lives to him, that I'm in him and he's in me. And when that happens, we are to be aligned with Christ and his heart and, and his desires. And that means loving others. That means loving his church, all of it. I've heard people say, you can't love Christ and not love his bride. The church is the bride of Christ. And if you love Jesus, but you don't like the church, well, then you're not aligned with Christ because Christ loved the church. Yes, it's broken and messy and there are, there are issues in the church. I'll give you that. But you see the beautiful thing about the church, about those who have given themselves to Christ, is that they're being conformed to the likeness of Christ. That they're being made more and more in his image. And see, that's what we're celebrating. When we celebrate the sacrament of communion, we're, we're celebrating that we are in Christ. That Christ has accepted us into his family and we are giving ourselves to him that we might love like he loves, that we might serve as he served, and that we might be united as he has called us to be. One body, Christ is the head. That's what we're doing when we, when we have the, the juice and, and, we, and we have the bread. What we're doing is we're declaring, I'm with Jesus. And if Jesus loves all these people, if Jesus loves the haves and Jesus loves the have-nots, well, then I'm going to love the haves. And I'm going to love the have-nots. And when they draw their little circle and they, they exclude me, because of the love of Jesus, I'm going to draw my circle even bigger. And we're going to walk together, including Jew and Gentile, slave and free, 
male and female. Because that's who we are in Christ. As we prepare to partake in this holy sacrament, if you're new to this in, in the Church of the Nazarene, we don't have a list of rules and requirements to partake. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to take a special class. You don't have to reach a certain age. The only requirement is that you want to be with Jesus. That you have given yourself to him and that you have received his free gift of salvation. And if you've done that, then I invite you to partake with us, to, to stand hand in hand and say, I love Jesus and all these people here. As the music plays, I would encourage you to, to take some time for, for self-reflection. To look within yourself because there are times when we draw those circles and we don't even realize that we're doing it. It starts innocently. But if we don't examine ourselves, if we don't look at it, we can get settled in those circles and we can, we can neglect to, to love. So as the music plays, I would invite you to, when you're ready, to make your way down the center aisle to receive the elements, the bread and the juice. And once you've done that, take them back to your seats. And when everyone has done that, then we will all partake in this holy sacrament together. I now pass on to you that which has been passed on to me. That on the night when Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he first gathered together with his friends, his disciples, and together they shared a meal. It was during that meal that Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. You may partake of the bread. In the same fashion, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. You may partake of the cup. As we come together, the sacrifice of Christ, the, the blood that he spilled upon the cross, it, it broke down all the barriers. It broke down the barriers between God and mankind. It broke down the barriers between one another because in perfect relationship, we can have relationship with God and our brothers and sisters. And that's what we're celebrating. As we partake in this sacrament of communion, the idea that Paul is trying to get into the, the head of this church is that it's not about you. It's not about your desires. It's about the unity that we have, and it's about the mission that God has given us. And so as we, as we celebrate this sacrament, we do so hand in hand, brothers and sisters in Christ, not a group of haves and have-nots, but united as one in the body of Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrament that you have given us. God, we thank you that, that you have invited us into a relationship with you. That you have broken down the walls, that you've broken down the barriers and invited us in. And God, I pray that we would not draw an even smaller circle around just the people that we like. But God, that when, when those circles are drawn, God, we would expand it. That we would expand our circles to engulf those who have rejected us, that have rejected you. God, that we would stand united for your kingdom. God, I pray that, that your love would fill us. As we give ourselves to you and receive you into us, God, I pray that, that your love would overflow 
dismantle these rival groups, these cliques, these factions, and that we would stand united as the body of Christ. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. I love you and we'll see you next week.